<laughs> so Priska today is going to talk to us about trauma-informed teaching, what it is, what it's not, and strategies for teachers. And this is, like I said, our second plenary of the night. Thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, it is currently 1.30 uh, a.m. where I am, or rather 2 o'clock in the morning where I am, so I'm a little sleepy. Forgive any um, hiccups here. Uh, so let's get started. Um, recently in Puerto Rico, we had another earthquake, uh, 5.0. That was yesterday. I mean, these, these uh, tremors are ongoing. So please remember to donate. Any little bit helps. Um, in some of, those, uh, some of the slides, you're going to see a uh, QR code that says scan me. That'll take you directly to the EFL for Puerto Rico, oh, sorry, EL for Puerto Rico. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. It was some sort of connection error. Okay. So what it is, what it's not, and strategies for uh, teachers. Okay. Just a little bit of background information first. There are approximately 1 billion children, ages 2 through 7, uh, who have experienced physical, sexual, or emotional violence or neglect. And uh, just to put it in perspective on a global scale, that's pretty much over half of all children. So if you are thinking right now, well, what, what, why would I need trauma-informed teaching in my classroom? Um, this is why you, you cannot assume uh, there's so much trauma worldwide um, and really any trauma-informed strategy that you implement in the classroom will benefit all students, it's not just the traumatized students. And you'll see why as, uh, as the presentation goes along. Okay, so how does trauma transfer into the classroom? Um, check these out and, and, and think about uh, your most challenging student as I'm, as I'm mentioning these. So first of all, aggression. It might happen suddenly, it might happen without warning. You scratch your head and wonder what was the trigger for that? Um, we were laughing just you know a moment ago. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of times with uh, traumatized children, you can definitely see aggression in the classroom towards others, towards themselves, towards you as a teacher. Um, another way that trauma can transfer into the classroom is through avoidance. They don't want to do the work. They will tell you that they will tell you that they don't care. They don't care about the consequences. It seems like nothing you do will get them back on track. And of course, this results in increasing frustration um, and potentially uh, uh, results in a power struggle between you and the student. Um, another way that this transfers into the classroom is that they they shut down. They don't. They don't even respond. They'll put their head down like this uh, young boy in the picture, and they'll, you know, let's say just just continue without me. They'll, they'll try to pretend to disappear. They want to become invisible, and there are other off-putting behaviors. Uh, uh, you know, depending on their age, um, the little ones like this one might stick out their tongues. Some of them might be playing with a pencil incessantly, maybe stabbing at the desk. Just little things here and there that um, give a clue that that something might um, be happening inside this child's mind. Okay, so what do students need? And I and I and again, I want to make sure that you understand this is uh, these are needs for absolutely every single student in your classroom. All students need to feel safe. They need to feel that as soon as they step into your classroom, it's a safe zone. They don't feel threatened. They don't feel like uh, like it's a judgment area. They need to feel completely safe to be able to learn in that space uh, and be in that space. They need to uh, they need to feel seen. They need to feel heard, and this is really important. They need to feel known. A lot of times, we um, as teachers, you know, we have. 30 students in the classroom, this is not exactly an easy thing to do, right? Um, so uh, some th this is this is a part where sometimes we can be a little ne neglectful because of the sheer number of students. Um, but as, uh, there are some structures that you can put in place into your classrooms where even if it's like one minute, two minutes, say 30 seconds, where you connect with students and let them know, I see you. I hear you, and I'm get, at least I'm getting to know you, right? Because at the beginning of the year, you just met. But you, you have to make sure that those structures are in place so that the students can feel this every time. And of course, they need, to, they need to feel cared for. If they feel that you don't care, if they feel that you're not fair, if they feel that you know they're just a number in your classroom, 
you're going to have a difficult time. They're going to have a difficult time and it's fun for absolutely no one. So these are three major things that all students need when they're in the classroom with you. Okay, so uh, what is trauma-informed teaching and, and, and what it isn't? So, so here's what it's not. It does not mean you get to take over the role of counselor. It does not mean you get to take over the role of psychologist or social worker, et cetera. You are still the teacher, okay? Um, and it does not mean under any circumstances that you should attempt to find out what the child's trauma is because you could end up re-traumatizing that student. Um, so avoid uh, that curiosity of going to an adult that might know what exactly what happened if you have an idea that hmm, this child may have been traumatized, um, and let's say that the uh, psychologist or the counselor doesn't know that, I, I mean, by all means, report it, absolutely. Um, but try to avoid to find out any details unless the student themselves, they come, the, you know, they approach you and they want to share that with you. Um, that is very different, okay? Because at all costs, we, with the, we might have the best intentions in the world, um, but we can sometimes end up re-traumatizing these students, all right? Um, so, so what is trauma-informed teaching? It's this shift from what is wrong with you? Why are you pushing my buttons today? To what happened to you? What triggered this? How can I help you? How can we work together? It is a, 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 it is a really big shift in perspective. It might not sound like it, but it really is. Um, where you are going from frustrated to trying to, you know, figure out how to move forward, how to make things better, how to help that student learn, how to help that student feel safe, feel seen, feel heard, feel wanted. Okay, so it's that shift in, pers in perspective that questions and challenges assumptions about what students should or should not know and why or how they respond to stimuli. <clears throat> I mean, think about it. You have a, a student any, anywhere from kindergarten through uh, 12th grade, right? And you ask them the question, uh, so what's your home address? Where do you live? You expect some sort of answer from the kindergarten student, you know, uh, the name of their town, the name of their street, something. You expect that full address from the student who's in 12th grade. But maybe you get an, I don't know, or I forgot, or there's some hesitance that makes you wonder if they know their address. And you can respond in different ways, right? Uh, the frustrated <laughs> teacher response could be, "Well, how could you not know this? Why don't you know this?" You know, and 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 you and you enter that judgment zone without meaning to. Um, and then there's that other uh, area and type of response where you could say, "You could say, okay, let me help you uh, learn your address. This is really important because, etc." So then you launch into the um, the solution. This is a very low stress area for the student. They're not feeling like a failure. They're not feeling like you're judging them. And they're focused more on, okay, learning my address is important. Let's go ahead and get to it. So that's that's that shift that I'm talking about in perspective where you go from, you know, so-and-so wants to push my buttons today. Oh no, what are we going to do? To that curiosity. Why is the student acting this way today? Um, why is he having difficulties remembering his address? How can we help him work through that? Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, I could talk all day about trauma-informed strategies. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this particular slide. I had to put a lot of information in, in each slide uh, from this point forward, so please bear with me. Um, I would like to go ahead and read the quote that I have here. I think it's an excellent one. At a time when schools and teachers are exceedingly stressed and stretched, becoming trauma-informed may seem an ambitious and challenging strategy. However, the rewards for everyone involved are real and energizing. I cannot stress this enough. Um, <clears throat> I uh, currently teach in an alternative uh, high school. So I have students anywhere from 16 through 24 attending my classes. And um, I use trauma-informed uh, teaching strategies every single day. And I cannot stress enough the value of trauma-informed -inform teaching strategies across the board. It doesn't matter if you're a pre-kindergarten teacher or a 12th grade teacher or beyond. These are strategies that are gonna be incredibly helpful uh, for your students. 
And I know it may seem like just another thing to do. <clears throat> and trust me, I fully understand, understand there is so much on our plates right now. But this um, using trauma informed teaching will actually help you take back some of that time that, that you know, we constantly struggle for um, because you're going to have less students, um, you know, that that act out, that um, cut into that instructional time. So I want to talk to you about four areas, connection, classroom environment, teaching and learning. Whenever you have students in the classroom, you, ne you need that connection. You need to establish that connection somehow. Um, uh, and part of doing that, uh, remember that students, one of the three things that I told you students need is that feeling of safety. Um, so you need to include these students in, in those talks about, about safety. Very first day of, of the school year, you refresh their memories uh, uh, in the middle of the school year. You might ask them to help you revamp them, right? Let's do a, a safety check. Let's do a, a recheck um, so that you can, you know, uh, so that they can tell you, well, what is working? What isn't working? Do I still feel safe? Do I not feel safe? And why? When you include students in, in, the, in these kinds of conversations and in any kind of conversation, right, in the classroom, you give them power. And you avoid those power struggles that, you know, uh, we get into so many times with students because they need to feel that they have some sort of control, especially with traumatized children. Uh, they've lost, you know, they, they've lost control in their lives and they are always grasping for, OK, what is that one element or two that I can control in the classroom? Um, is it to get into this fight with a teacher? Is it to um, disrupt the classroom? Is it to have a real connection and real conversations with my teacher? Uh, you also, need, I want you to tap into student experiences. I don't care if your student's three years old or 24, they have had experiences, I guarantee you, that you have not. They know things that you do not. And again, I don't care if you're a 60 year old teacher uh, listening to me right now, I guarantee you, they know something that you don't. That's one assumption that, that, that I want everyone to strike from their experience. Just because you are the teacher does not mean you know absolutely everything. And again, they have had experiences that you have not. Um, so tap into those experiences. Uh, make sure that uh, to highlight the, the positives. Um, do they like art? Do they like music? Uh, tap into their hobbies. Every little bit helps in making those connections. If you know a certain person really likes um, to learn about dinosaurs, to learn about cars, to read about this or that, that is something that you can use to help make those connections. Um, uh, the last one under connections is use student expertise and feedback. And I already uh, talked a little bit about the student expertise. Now I want to talk about feedback. Oh, this is where I take a deep breath, right? Because it is very difficult to ask students for feedback. <laughs> um, we will have those student outliers, which will always give us um, comments that we don't want to hear. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, we will have students who just kind of rush through it just to get over it. The more you get students used to giving you feedback, and this part is super important, and the more you actually use that feedback to make changes in your classroom, the more quality feedback you will get, get from your students. Again, K through 12, there are different ways to ask for feedback from a kindergartner uh, than from a 24 year old, let's say, or an 18 year old, but you, it, you know, it can be done. What are some of the questions that you can ask those students as you are uh, requesting feedback? Do they feel safe? Do they feel seen? Do they feel heard? Do they feel loved? Ask those key questions that you know they need in the classroom, okay? If they say no at any moment, it's not that you failed. It's that, you know, we need to revisit some, some of the structures in place in the classroom so that they can go ahead and feel safe, seen, heard, wanted, and cared for. Okay, so that's everything under connection. Let's go to classroom environment. Um, people who have gone through trauma crave structure. They crave procedures. Have procedures for everything. And some of you might be thinking right now, oh, I definitely have procedures. It still doesn't work or I still have problems or X or Y. Um, the thing is that your procedures have to be explicitly taught and, ex and, and visible throughout the classroom every single day. 
Do you use the finger fist system where you hold up a finger and they're, I don't know, asking for a pencil, they hold up two fingers and they want to go to the bathroom, any kind of system that you have in place, make sure that you have an infographic up on the wall or make sure that students create their own anchor chart so that they can remember, oh yeah, this is what we talked about, this is what I need to do if I wanna sharpen my pencil or something or I want to go to the bathroom. And um, I need you to get used to the idea that you are going to uh, come back to this and reteach this to refresh their memories constantly. Traumatized children will forget. They will not willfully forget, but they will forget a lot of things. Um, and you may have had this experience before where you've said something, the students seem to have understood, they engaged in their conversation, it was fantastic, and then you let them go to do something independently, and they, for, and, and they have no idea what, the, what is it that we're doing? They ask you that question. They, they forgot. And it is genuine. It is absolutely worrying. But the, you know, we, we can deal with that as long as we are very aware and very sensitive to the needs of, of you know, all children, of course, but of, of traumatized children and how this happened and that this can absolutely happen, um, then we'll, we will be better prepared to meet their needs in the classroom. Um, okay, I have 13 minutes left approximately, so let me continue. Uh, so under classroom environment, uh, groupings or stations. I have some pictures I will show you in the next uh, few slides where I'll show you the stations that I use in my classroom currently with these, you know, up to 24 year olds. Um, so I believe so much in groupings. Um, I teach whole group maybe 10 minutes of my day, you know, of my of, of, of each class uh, class period. 10 to 15 minutes tops, whole group, and then everybody is, is separated into stations. This allow for, allows for more connections. This allows for more one-on-one -on -one time with the students. Um, is X and Y having, having a hard day? Well, while I have these other students working uh, in groups or independently in their stations, I can address that issue. I can come back to this person. I can have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Do I have students that really need more one-on-one -on -one time with me uh, for the lesson, I have time to do that as well, okay? And uh, these stations also offer opportunities for student choice. Again, avoid those power, power str struggles. Give students choice um, in what, in even in the stations, okay? Let's say that you have uh, Johnny in um, the small group station practicing their writing today. He won't have any of it. That's okay, I have two other stations where you can go. Where would you like to go today? I have no problem with that, okay? And really marry uh, with that idea that you have no problem with that because you, you want that student learning any way that they can in the moment. Okay, so number three is teaching. Um, slow down. I don't know if you can tell, I do have a problem with this one. <laughs> I tend to go very quickly <laughs> uh, and have to remind myself to, to slow down a lot. Uh, and, you know, slow yourself down in speech, in body, in movement. Uh, so many students who have been traumatized, like I mentioned before, um, they have experienced sexual violence and that sudden movement or that touch on the shoulder that is absolutely innocent ooh, might give them flashbacks. OK, so be 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 very cognizant of that. If you suspect that the student has any issue with touching, avoid it at all costs. And uh, when you can have these honest conversations, like I'm, I'm, I, I like to touch you on the shoulder when I want you to pay attention to me. Is that okay? Is there anything? Is there any other signal that that you want me to to use in the classroom so that you feel comfortable with? Make sure to always engage in the conversation. Okay. Next one is model mindfulness. Um, mindfulness timeout. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna leave this one for the next slide because I have an example I wanna show you with it. Uh, practice and model positive self-talk. Admit your mistakes. We pl make plenty of mistakes in the classroom. Oh gosh, uh, sorry guys, I forgot about X, Y, and Z. That's my mistake, but you know what? We spent our time doing or talking about this or that and that was very productive. So even, <clears throat> even when you highlight a mistake you've made, you also highlight um, the, the positives, right? Uh, how, 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 you know, you benefit or what you learn, you, you should highlight something positive whenever you mention that you've made a mistake or that, you know, something, there's something negative. And with learning, fidget toys, you don't have to get fancy. This doesn't have to get expensive. Um, 
if you have students that have chewed, you know, their pencil, you to just bite marks all over, it could be that they need to then touch that pencil to feel the roughness of the pencil to calm themselves down, or they need something to do. So, you know, fidget toys, again, it, it could be anything as simple, ball up a, a, a piece of paper and have them and have them crush it uh, between their fingertips so that they have something to do. So if you see uh, some of these students who are antsy, like they have ants in their pants, have them get up as well. Have them stand by their chair. If it's possible for your classroom, I know sometimes it isn't, uh, allow them to move around a little, a little, and again, let them know that they're okay. Because a lot of times they're going to do these things anyway because they have to, because their body and their brains push them to do these things. You need to think about providing them with um, times and, and, and places inside the classroom where they can do these kinds of things. Okay, um, I want you to, um, okay, uh, next one, sketch nail note taking. Now, this is a combination of sketch notes. You can look it up if you're not familiar with it. And the um, Cornell uh, note taking strategies, it allows them to draw. We have a lot of artists in the classroom. We have a lot of uh, students, you know, traumatized or otherwise, that need to be able to draw things, um, again, to calm down, to make those visual connections. And sketch nail note taking um, strategies do help. Um, you need to give them extra time to write down questions uh, and to process information uh, and be able to answer those questions. Hold your breath, wait 15 seconds. I mean it, count it in your head, tap your fingers, do whatever you need, at least 15 seconds, a little more if possible. It'll get uncomfortable really quickly because we're, we might not be used to that much silence, but it gives them a safe amount of time to be able to answer your questions, to be able to process them. Do you have a severely traumatized student who forgets everything? He has his hand raised, you call on him almost immediately. Oh, I forgot my question. That's okay, have them write it down. Okay, allow them to be able to do that. Maybe record it. There, there could be uh, some some way that that student is able to write down their questions so that they don't ha have to force themselves to remember and enter stress mode, right? Because of their stress, they don't they don't remember. They're starting to feel like like they don't know. Um, I hate the word, but some of the students will call themselves themselves stupid because of it, right? Like they don't know anything, and we want to avoid that at all costs because they do. Okay, next slide, I'm running out of time. Here are the examples I wanted to highlight. These are uh, current pictures from my classroom right now. Uh, I literally took these pictures this week. Um, so uh, the first picture on the left, you see a little bucket with some marker, coloring markers and uh, coloring pages. So my classroom has a very weird shape to it <laughs> and I've uh, made the most of it so that I can maximize the space. And I have a small section where we come together as a whole group and that's where you will see these coloring pages and markers. They can come in and I've told them from the very beginning, these pages are yours, these markers are yours. You can leave them here. As you, as you can see, they've left the work in, in progress in, in my classroom. Um, you can leave them here, you can use them whenever you need them. Do you need to pay attention? Do you need to focus? And do you find that by coloring, um, that actually helps you? For some of my students, it absolutely does. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. They're going to get distracted. They're going to use this as an excuse. Remember when I told you you need to be teaching certain things almost on a daily basis and you have to come back to it to repeat it? This is one of those things. You have to get them used to these structures in the classroom and it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and it didn't here. But in my classroom right now, it's to a point where I literally, let's say for my first period students, I have literally three students who use this almost all the time. The other students, it's rarely. And you know what, uh, what happens, however, when some of the other students who don't use this regularly do use it? It gives me an immediate heads up. It's a red flag. Let me get. Let me uh, touch base with a student at some point in the classroom. They're needing this today to, to focus. They're needing this today for some reason. When usually they don't need this to focus at all. Maybe something's wrong. Um, nine out of ten times, something's happening. Okay, and I'm but I'm able to now. Uh, have those red flags be very obvious in my classroom because I've Im implemented these strategies and I've gotten them very used to them. Uh, hmm, five minutes. Okay, so uh, the next uh, set of pictures shows my stations. So on the top is my independent uh, computer station where they practice uh, writing exercises, grammar, uh, speaking, etc. The bottom left shows that U-shaped table. This is where I have my small groups or my one-on-ones. And then on the right, oh, the right shows uh, 
somewhat a uh, better picture of where I hold my, my whole group classes. Uh, and this is where, again, I mentioned student choice. If a student doesn't feel like being in the station today, all right, let's move you on to another one. Where would you like to go? And finally, on the right, um, this is my mindful moments section. This is where I said I was going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, so student walks in, student is angry, student is triggered, something happened. It may not be the right time to ask them, you know, what happened to you? How can I help you? Uh, but it may be the right time for them to go to the mindful moments, table, section, folder, whatever you have, so that they can unroll that yoga mat. It's, I know it's hard to see there uh, in this picture, but I have a little yoga mat there. It might be time to grab that writing folder and write something. It might be time to grab um, uh, headphones and listen to music. It might be time to grab markers and do something, okay? It might be time to just sit there quietly. I have a section in my classroom that is explicitly de dedicated to these mindful moments. They need a timeout, they need to step away, they can go there. Again, it's a structure that's in place in my classroom that immediately lets me know something's going on, I need to address this before it becomes an issue in my classroom. So, um, Ooh, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here are some special tips for every teacher because it's not easy to teach. <laughs> it's not easy when we have severely traumatized students in the classroom. It's not easy in any you know, given time with any uh, given demographic. Um, and it is very possible, you know, we are, we are very caring teachers. We are very loving teachers. And it is very possible that we experience uh, secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, however you want to call it. When we care too much, we take all of that home, um, which we should try to avoid, but we all know that's that's not quite possible. So here's some things that you can do to help yourself breathe through it and, and you know, get through your days. You need to, I want you to recognize that there are uh, triggers that you can control and there are some triggers that you cannot control. I want you to recognize that things will not change overnight. Okay. Again, they will not change overnight. This isn't working. Give it, give it, give it time. Okay. Give it a chance and you'll see that some things will absolutely work. I want you to recognize that you cannot fix it. You cannot fix any of it. It happened. It was terrible. You may or may not know what happened to these students, but you cannot fix it. And it's okay. I need you to, to be able to accept that. Um, I also need you to understand that, to recognize that it takes a team. It's a team effort. Um, the schools that have had the best success with trauma-informed teaching are the schools who it take an all-hands-on-deck approach, from the administration to the janitors to the teachers, every single person in that campus, okay? And if you're in the unfortunate space where it's, you know, it's just you, you're starting this out, then be the person who spearheads it, be the person who begins it. I want you to practice radical acceptance and radical kindness. Do not confuse this with um, accepting every little wrongdoing that students may, you know, may have any misbehaviors. And that's not what I mean. Again, radical acceptance is back to that. These traumas happened. It happened. To, they happened to my students. They are absolutely unfair. But I'm going to practice that radical kindness. So, uh, you know, to show them that they are worthy of love. Um, remember, it's okay to step away and take care of yourself. Yes, I'm looking at you, teacher, who stays uh, in, in, the, in the classroom until seven or eight, eight o'clock at night. You need to step away and take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be good for anybody. You're not going to be helpful for your students. And you may not even realize it, which is a problem. You should take time out when you need it. I need you to trust that you are doing enough. I need you to remember to reach out to others when you need help. It's okay to ask for help. I want you to accept that you may never see the results for your efforts. You may never see the results for your efforts. It doesn't mean that there aren't good results. It may mean, it may mean that it takes a little time and more hands on deck. Re accept that negative behaviors are not about you. The, uh, I need you to accept that some triggers happen in students' minds suddenly and unwittingly. In some cases, there is absolutely nothing you could have done. OK, and these I, I understand that these are some very hard things to accept. OK, <clears throat> we're back to the pictures of Puerto Rico. I want to remind you to please, please, please donate. And I want to thank you in advance so much for any little amount that you are able to to donate. OK, um, well, I'll go back to here so you can scan that. That's it for my presentation. Thank you so much for having me and have a great night, everybody. Thank you.